looking to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Good afternoon, I'm Alma Angeles and you're watching ASEAN in Focus and we're coming to you live from Manila and Vietnam. Hello, Eliana. Hello, Alma, and hello to all of our viewers. I'm Eliana Sebastian, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. More than 1,000 aftershocks rattled the earthquake hit northern Philippines as President Marcos inspected damage in the region. China and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations will soon hammer out the most contentious provisions of the mechanics for the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea. The UN Security Council has condemned the Myanmar junta's execution of four prisoners, drawing praise from a shadow government of ousted Myanmar lawmakers. And later, overripe palm oil fruit hangs on trees while others lie scattered around a plantation as Malaysian farmers reap a bitter harvest from a severe labor shortage. First in our news, more than a thousand aftershocks rattled the earthquake hit northern Philippines as President Marcos inspected damage in the region. Five people were killed, more than 150 injured when a seven magnitude quake struck the lightly populated province of Abra on Wednesday morning. The death toll rose to six on Thursday when a 59-year-old man was hit by a landslide caused by an aftershock. Some families have been given modular tents to stay in. President Marcus Jr. has urged people to wait for their homes to be inspected before moving back. Hundreds of buildings were damaged or destroyed. Roads were blocked by landslides and power was knocked out in affected areas. A state of calamity was declared in Abra, which will enable the government to tap funds for the response effort. More than a thousand aftershocks have been recorded since the quake hit, including 24 that were strong enough to feel. President Marcos also conducted an inspection of the damaged areas in the province. He had ordered the immediate repair of the damaged roads and bridges, as well as the power lines affected by the quake. He was accompanied by his sister, Senator Amy Marcos, and by some of his cabinet secretaries when he visited the quake-damaged province. The region continues to feel aftershocks after the strong tremor. The quake also affected nearby provinces of Ilocos Sur, La Union, Mountain Province, Benguet, Cagayan, Nueva Vizcaya, and other parts of northern Luzon. Meanwhile, President Marcos has also ordered the intensified response to the victims of the magnitude 7 earthquake in Luzon. The powerful quake rippled across the mountainous area, toppling buildings, triggering landslides and shaking high-rise towers hundreds of kilometers away in the capital, Manila. Let's listen in. Together with the local government so that uh, we can make sure na walang... Uh, uh, nangangailangan na hindi natin nabigyan ng tulong. Uh, that's just uh, the LGUs are, are always the, the ones, kayo, the, the municipal mayors, uh, the governors, the vice governors, ay kayong nakakaalam kung ano, uh, what the situation is on the ground. We can, we will have, we will just have to do as much as we can, as quickly as possible. Uh, of course, that, that's going to be for the key for, for, uh, uh, our relief efforts, lahat ng gagawin natin. We have to be able to communicate and we have to be able to operate. So we need, that's why inuna ko yung dalawang yun, to find out uh, how, what, our, what, our, uh, what our capabilities are. There's one more question I had in terms of service. Wala namang na, nag, nagka-problema na putulan ng, ng water supply? Meron din. Oh, that's, that, that's something that we have to, we're here in Banggit? Oh, anong nangyari? Dahil siguro sa movement ng soil or whatever. Well, that again is actually even more of a priority than communications and uh, power. As for these disasters, in the meantime, I'm sending one to Abra. Very well, <coughs> Mr. Oh. President. Sir. The, the, 
one of the one of the things that we have found useful uh, in all of the disaster, pagka water supply ay nagiging problema, are the water purifying systems that are very simple. You've seen them before, yung nasa balde, and then they have a they have a filter. Uh, we should procure more of those because immediately water is always going to be a problem. Para hindi you know things like cholera, diphtheria will will come into play. So uh, tignan natin na mabuti yon. I think, in fact, I know already of a source where we can immediately get them. There is a, um, it is actually an aid agency. And yun lang ang trabaho nila. President Marcus also wanted immediate repair of roads and bridges. He wanted the uh, restoration of water supply and telco services. He has tasked personnel to conduct a quick assessment of structures so that people could go back to their homes. The armed forces of the Philippines, meanwhile, also assured President Marcos Jr. that it has available air assets that could be used for airlift operations to reach the isolated areas affected by the magnitude 7 earthquake that hit northern Luzon on Wednesday. Lieutenant General Ernesto Torres Jr., the commander of the Northern Luzon Command, or NOLCOM, told the president during the briefing that the AFP General Headquarters allocated 10 aircraft for post-disaster response in the Ilocos, Cagayan Valley, and Cordillera regions. Two choppers, he said, are already in Abra, ready to conduct sorties. The AFP has also deployed more than 100 personnel who could support search and rescue efforts, adding that 500 additional personnel are also on standby. China and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the ASEAN, will soon hammer out the most contentious provisions of the mechanics for the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea. Daniel Espiritu, Assistant Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs for ASEAN Affairs, said China and ASEAN have already agreed on the text of the preamble of the Code of Conduct when the Philippines was coordinator of the negotiations. Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and lately Indonesia. China, as well as its renegade province, Taiwan, are claiming the entire South China Sea. However, talks bogged down as China and individual ASEAN members could not agree on provisions they believe could jeopardize their claims. As a result, China continues its artificial island building spree in the South China Sea, and incidents of mere collision occur more frequently involving Chinese, Filipino, and Vietnamese fishermen on end coast guards. Foreign Affairs Secretary Enrique Manalo is said to assert the 2016 arbitral ruling as the Philippines anchored to its actions in the West Philippine Sea in the upcoming meeting of Southeast Asian Foreign Ministers next month. The 55th ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting and related meetings will be held from August 2 to 6 in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. China, under its so-called Nine Dash Line, claims most of the resource-rich South China Sea. The Hague-based decision, constituted under the UNCLOS, ruled that the claim of historic rights to resources in areas falling within this invisible demarcation had no basis in law and is without legal effect. A U.S. aircraft carrier and its strike group are now in the South China Sea and what could potentially become a tense standoff in hotly contested waters near Taiwan. Speaking to Insider on Wednesday night, U.S. Navy spokesperson Mark Langford confirmed that the vessels were on the move and operating in the South China Sea. The aircraft carrier departed Singapore after making a scheduled port visit on July 22. According to Line 4, the carrier is continuing normal scheduled operations as part of a routine patrol in support of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Pelosi was scheduled to travel to the island in April. However, the trip was postponed after she tested positive for COVID-19. For the Financial Times, Pelosi is tentatively set to visit the island in August. Beijing next this week warned that it was getting ready for a possible visit by Pelosi, which would be the first to Taiwan by a sitting U.S. House Speaker since 1997.
Meanwhile, China warned this week of a possible military response if Pelosi's trip took place. A possible visit by Pelosi has stirred alarm in Biden's administration, which fears the trip may cross red lines for China. In a related news, China warned that Washington would bear the consequences if U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visits Taiwan. Let's take a look. Pelosi中一张访台的严正立场。除外交部发言人以外，中国国防部、国台办也发表了声明。中国国防部发言人表示。如果美方一意孤行，中国军队绝不会坐视不管，必将采取强有力措施，挫败任何外部势力干涉和台独分裂的图谋。中国人说到做到。U.S. President Biden recently said the U.S. was ready to defend Taiwan militarily in an invasion going beyond just providing weapons, although the White House has walked back his remarks. Democratic Taiwan lives under constant threat of, Beijing, of being invaded by China, which views it as part of its territory to be seized by force if necessary. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has long been an outspoken critic of Beijing's human rights record. In 1991, outraging her hosts by unfurling a banner in Tiananmen Square in memory of pro-democracy demonstrators killed there two years earlier. And this week, Malaysia's foreign minister slammed the Myanmar junta's execution of four prisoners, including two leading pro-democracy figures, calling it a crime against humanity. Let's listen in. Uh, we condemn the action by the junta to execute the four activists. We feel that uh, this is a crime against humanity. Uh, I believe the foreign ministers, when we meet in Phnom Penh on the 3rd of August, will look into this. And just about a week before the ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in Phnom Penh. So we look at it that as if the junta is making a mockery of the five-point consensus. The ten-nation bloc in April 2021 reached a five-point consensus with the junta, which calls for a cessation of violence and constructive dialogue. But violence continued with anti-junta groups clashing regularly with the military, which is accused of torching villages. Myanmar's junta-appointed foreign minister has not been invited to the bloc's foreign minister's meeting next week, according to the Cambodian state media. Myanmar's military spokesperson Zhao Min Tun defended the execution, saying they were enacted under the law. Let's take a look. However, Human Rights Watch Deputy Asia Director Phil Robertson said the four executions in Myanmar were politically motivated and could be just the first of dozens. He suggested uh, more political prisoners might have already been executed in the, in the day since. He also called for the international community to look to specific intervention. Let's listen in. This is clearly a signal to the Myanmar people from the junta that they are prepared to do whatever it takes, whatever rights abuses, whatever atrocities, whatever crimes, uh, that it, they think they need to do in order to try to control the situation. 
they are now moving to execute political prisoners. That is the message today, that we will stop at nothing. Uh, it is a sign of the depravity of the Myanmar junta that they are prepared to take this kind of step. Uh, you know, because they have been executed will cause a great deal of anger, frustration, and further determination by the Myanmar people to get rid of this military junta. Because uh, ultimately, uh, there is now a war going on between uh, this military junta and the people of the country. Uh, people are no longer prepared to be ruled by this military junta, and this military junta is using uh, absolute force uh, to try to impose its will on the country. Uh, so, as I said, we're really moving towards a civil war where the human rights situation is going to get much worse. What we have really seen over the past year is a level of disassociation from the international community. Uh, you know, pushing aside Myanmar, saying that there are other places like Ukraine or other spots that are more important. And they have allowed this situation to get much, much worse. Uh, there's been a failure to impose sanctions. There's been a failure to impose a global arms embargo. All the sort of things that we were calling for last year that were absolutely critical to try to constrain a military junta that appears ready to commit crimes against humanity, against its own people in order to uh, assert power. Uh, and again, nothing happened. But ASEAN has proved completely unable to cope with the challenge. I mean, ASEAN itself is split right down the middle uh, on how to approach this problem. So it's now time uh, for the international community to take it out of the hands of ASEAN and really look now uh, to some sort of specific intervention uh, that is going to then uh, put the pressure on the military junta, uh, force them to step back, and ultimately, we hope, uh, reach some sort of deal where there can be a new political future for Myanmar. Meanwhile, the UN Security Council has condemned the Myanmar junta's execution of the four prisoners and it drew praise Thursday from a shadow government of ousted Myanmar lawmakers. In a rare consensus on the post-coup crisis, the Security Council on Wednesday released a statement condemning the executions, Myanmar's first in decades, and calling for the immediate release of ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi. It said they recalled the Secretary General's statement as of July 25 and echoed his call for the immediate release of all arbitrarily detained prisoners. The statement was endorsed by Russia and China the junta's two major allies that have previously shielded it, shielded it at the UN as well as neighboring India. The Minist Foreign Ministry said it had summoned a senior Myanmar embassy diplomat on Thursday to protest the junta's execution of four prisoners, adding to a chorus of international condemnation. A foreign ministry spokesman confirmed to AFP that the summons for the charge the affairs had taken place in Berlin after the ministry's director general for Asia and the Pacific wrote about it on Twitter. In her tweet, Petra Stigman quoted Germany's representative for East Asia and the Pacific, Martin Thumel, as saying that Berlin condemned the executions most strongly and called on Myanmar to reinstate the moratorium on the use of the death penalty and end violence and repression. The words echo the condemnation the German foreign ministry issued earlier this week. It said it was appalled by the executions, which showed the junta's contempt for the strong democratic aspirations of the people of Myanmar. Myanmar's execution of four prisoners, including a former member of Aung San Suu Kyi's party, is highly reprehensible, said the chair of a regional bloc, leading diplomatic efforts to resolve the post-coup crisis. Cambodia, which currently heads the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or the ASEAN, said the bloc was extremely troubled and deeply saddened by the executions. Myanmar's first in decades. In a statement issued Tuesday, it accused the junta of a gross lack of will to engage with ASEAN's efforts to facilitate dialogue between the military and its opponents. The statement also noted the executions had taken place 
despite the personal appeal of Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen to halt proceedings. Vote counting in Papua New Guinea's general elections was extended by a fortnight as violence and destruction disrupted the already month-long poll. The country's governor general announced the extension with the return of writs moving from July 29 to August 12, as he called for an end to attacks in an election marred by the hijacking of ballot boxes and at least a dozen deaths. Let's watch this. The atmosphere in the national capital city has slightly calmed down after the unrest and violence that gripped the streets days ago. However, schools, some business firms, and other roads remain closed. Law enforcers are working round the clock to restore peace and order. City leaders encourage the candidates to talk to supporters and end the violence, allowing normalcy to return to the capital. As of this report, counting of ballots has resumed in Surgeon Guy Stadium under the supervision of the Papua New Guinea Defense Force and Papua New Guinea Royal Constabulary Police. Uh, in Port Moresby, we're having a general election where of Electoral Commission will be declaring all the members who is leading the race. I think some boxes will be left, so the others running up will be feeling frustrated. So they will demand that the Electoral Commission to give another seven days so to continue the counting. Otherwise, they declare that Whoever is leading, when they declare, it's going to create some chaos in Papua New Guinea. As a Papua New Guinea man, I wish the outcome of the election, I wish a peaceful man and a good leader to take a prime minister and run our country to bring our economies and the standard of our country back to this level. There is also a proposal of extending the date of Ritz's return from the original July 29, 2022 deadline to August 12, 2022, to complete all ballot countings in the entire Papua New Guinea. Echo Hortaleza Quinola, Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang paghirap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Pagalang ng tagapamahalang pangkalahatan ng Iglesia ni Cristo ka Eduardo Manalo, sampu ng buong pamunuan at mga kasapi ng Iglesia. 
Nais kong ipaabot ang aking taus-pusong pagbati ng maligayang anibersaryo sa ika-isang daan at walong taon ng pagkakatatan ng Iglesia ni Kristo. Hangad ko ang patuloy na tagumpay sa pagsasakatuparan ng inyong dakilang misyon ng pagpapalaganap ng mabuting aral ng ating Panginoon at ang pagilunsad ng inyong mga proyektong kapaki-pakinabang sa ating mga kababayan at sa buong kapatiran. Muli, maligayang anibersaryo sa Iglesia ni Kristo. Season 2 ng Ling Up Stories tuwing linggo, alas 5 ng hapon sa NET25. And the news continues. Zero Nasyon and Focus, we're still coming to you live from Manila and Vietnam with Eliana Sebastian. Now, President Joko Widodo on Thursday said, President Joko Widodo on Thursday said that South Korea has agreed to support the development of the country's new capital, Nusantara, with a total investment of 6.37 billion U.S. dollars. As part of South Korea's support for IKN development, a memorandum of understanding on investment cooperation was signed by Indonesian steel company PT Krakatau Steel, the Ministry of Investment and South Korea's uh, POSCO Holdings. Krakatau Steel and POSCO agreed to invest in the expansion of steel production capacity, especially for the production of electric vehicles and the development of IKN Nusantara investment under the cooperation is estimated to reach 3.5 billion U.S. dollars. The South Korean government also agreed to build a, was a wastewater treatment plant for IKN Nusantara in East Kalimantan province. The government will build a similar smart village in IKN Nusantara consisting of 100 housing units as a pilot project. Project. The construction of the Smart Village is planned to begin in 2023 next year with South Korea's assistance. The ratification of certain foundational treaties to be ensured for the Philippines to maximize the benefits under the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, Senator Francis Tolentino said on Tuesday. He said foundational treaties that include the Hague Choice of Court Convention, United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, and Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts, should be reconsidered before engaging with the RCEP. He urged his fellow lawmakers to reassess all treaties which the Philippines are non-state parties to and consider the protection of the country's international commercial transactions for the betterment of the Philippine economy, which is a clear priority of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Tolentino noted that the ongoing, the foregoing rather, dispute settlement mechanisms are provided under the RCEP, but warned that acceding to the RCEP alone would Thank put you, the country Mr. at a disadvantage Mr. compared Mr. to other member countries who are state parties to other foundational and relevant treaties. The RCEP is the world's largest free trade agreement that provides simplicity in trade relations with its uniform terms and conditions among ASEAN, ASEAN member states, including Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, and their FTA partners, China, Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Meanwhile, South America's Mercosur has concluded a free trade agreement with Singapore. Announced uh, Foreign Minister Julio Ariola of Paraguay, one of the members of the trade bloc, Alongside Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, the fresh deal could boost the bloc's exports by some $500 million per year, according to official data 
first let's listen in economic links between singapore and mercosur have grown over the years and the fta can further catalyze this today singapore's trade with mercosur accounts for nearly half of our total trade with Latin America. To see trade, investment, and economic initiatives grow even more between Singapore and the region. Our joint efforts on the FTA demonstrate our commitment to deepen economic ties with each other. It is important that we encourage and support businesses to do likewise. This would help diversify our respective markets so they become more resilient. Mercosur exports to Singapore in 2021 amounted to 5.9 billion US dollars and imports 1.2 billion according to data provided by the four member bloc. Created in 1991, Mercosur represents a market of some 300 million people with a territory of almost 5.8 million square miles or 14.8 million square kilometers. The deal could mean additional exports of about $500 million per year to Singapore, a country of about 6 million million people, according to Paraguay's Deputy Economy Minister, Ivan Haas. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern warned an outbreak of food, food and mouth disease in Indonesia could cost thousands of New Zealand jobs as her nation and neighboring Australia stepped up border biosecurity restrictions. Let's take a look. In May, foot and mouth disease was detected in Indonesia and a few weeks ago in its tourist capital of Bali. It has been a priority of our government to strengthen our biosecurity system, investing a further 110 million in budget 2022 to ensure we have one of, if not the strongest system in the world to protect us from diseases like this, to preserve both our unique biodiversity and our agricultural sector worth over 52 billion to our economy. While the World Organization for Animal Health estimates the virus is present in 77% of the world's livestock population, New Zealand has never had an outbreak, and we want to do all we can to keep it that way. This is a new outbreak in Indonesia, which they are still working to manage, so it's important that we adjust for this new risk. Foot and mouth has been present in other countries for some time, and our tough biosecurity uh, settings have so far kept it out. While not a threat to humans, it would devastate our national herd. Essentially, all animals with, who are cloven-hooved are at risk. Cows, sheep, pigs, goats, deer and llama. In the event of foot and mouth reaching New Zealand, all trade in animal products would be stopped and rural businesses such as farms, farm contractors, animal processors and transporters would be affected. Animals would be slaughtered and more than 100,000 jobs in the primary sector would be at risk. And so while there are no direct flights from Indonesia to New Zealand, even the slightest potential for increased risk means we escalate our defences quickly. Biosecurity New Zealand has stopped travellers from bringing any personal consignments of any meat products from Indonesia and has installed disinfected foot mats for all arrivals from Indonesia. They also undertook an audit last month of Indonesia's palm kernel supply chain, which found it is meeting New Zealand's strict biosecurity requirements for foot and mouth disease. New Zealand has also provided Indonesia with PPE, disinfectant sprayers and other tools, as well as technical expertise to help them manage their outbreak. Ardern said her government is working with Australia, Australian authorities to try to further reduce the risk. New Zealand is set to fully open its borders at midnight on Sunday to all visitors. New Zealand's biosecurity minister, Damien O'Connor, said vigilance is absolutely crucial as the disease could also affect up to 77% of the country's wildlife population, including wild deer, pigs, and sheep. He referred to how foot and mouth devastated British farming in 2001, when millions of cattle and sheep had to be slaughtered. It is not necessary for Vietnam to undertake mass vaccinations against monkeypox at the moment. 
This is uh, based on risks and benefits according to Dr. Socorro Escalante, the acting WHO representative in Vietnam. Dr. Socorro Escalante made the recommendations on July 26 amidst the resurgence of monkeypox cases in Vietnam's surrounding countries, namely Thailand, Singapore, and China, and increasing and convenient travel demands. However, Dr. Socorro Escalante proposed that vaccinations should also be given to specific subjects, including people who have contact with infected persons, who should receive post-exposure vaccinations, healthcare workers and testers who support infectious patients. The acting WHO representative also said that there is no need to apply measures relating to the international travel on particular groups of population. So far, no cases have of monkeypox have been recorded in Vietnam, but there is a high risk of the disease reaching the border and infecting the population. Dr. Hong Yen, an epidemiologist at WHO in Vietnam, proposed that the country prepare capacity for diagnosis, isolation, and management so that when there is a case, it will contain the spread and minimize fatalities. Singapore has extended a short stay visa for Sri Lanka's deposed president Gotabaya Rajapaksa, local media in the city state reported on Wednesday. Rajapaksa fled his country on July 14 after his official residence was torn by thousands of protesters who had demonstrated for months against the island nation's painful economic crisis. He first escaped to the Maldives in a military plane and traveled on to Singapore where he, was, he has been staying on a short-term visit pass since July 14. Rajapaksa's 14-day visit pass has been extended, allowing him to stay until August 11. The Straits Times newspaper reported Wednesday without citing a source. Authorities had earlier said Rajapaksa entered the country on a private visit and was not seeking asylum. Sri Lanka's cabinet spokesperson, Bandula Gunawardena, told reporters in Colombo on Tuesday that Rajapaksa is not in hiding and is expected to return to his country, but added that the government has not been informed about his travel plans. Protesters blame Rajapaksa's government for mismanaging the country's finances, with the island nation defaulting on $51 billion debt and unable to afford to import even the most basic necessities. The country of 22 million people has suffered through months of lengthy blackouts, acute food and fuel shortages, and galloping inflation in its most severe economic downturn since gaining independence. And back here in the country, the Department of Interior and local government today called on local chief executives or LCEs in Northern Luzon to monitor their areas of jurisdiction for aftershocks and other related incidents following Wednesday's magnitude 7 earthquake. Interior Secretary Benjamin Abalos Jr. also urged local government units or the LGUs, the Philippine National Police and the Bureau of Fire Protection to mobilize response teams to help volunteer groups in the transportation of aid and relief packs. On Thursday, Mr. Abalos and other government officials accompanied President Marcus Jr. to the province of Abra to assess the damage brought by the earthquake. Based on initial assessment by authorities, 317 houses were totally damaged, while 3,177 were partially damaged by the tremor. Two private buildings were totally damaged, while 49 private buildings were partially damaged. Asian's pox rose Friday after data showing another contraction in the U.S. economy boosted hopes that the Federal Reserve will slow its pace of interest rate hikes. After an extended period of pessimism on trading floors, fueled by soaring inflation and the central bank's monetary tightening campaign, investors are beginning to speculate that the market may have reached its nadir. The gains extended a rally Wednesday that came after Fed Chief Jerome Powell I don't, I do not think the U.S. is currently in a recession. Um, and the reason is there are just too many areas of the economy that are, that are performing, uh, you know, 
too well. And, and of course, I would point to the labor market. We think that there's a path for us to be able to bring inflation down while sustaining a strong labor market, as I mentioned, along with, in all likelihood, some, some softening in labor market conditions. So most of Asia follows suit with Tokyo, Sydney, Seoul, Singapore, Taipei, Jakarta, and Wellington all up. However, Hong Kong dropped and Shanghai struggled. Meanwhile, overripe palm oil fruit hangs on trees while others lie scattered around a plantation as Malaysian farmers reap a bitter harvest from a severe labor shortage. The sector has long been reliant on migrants from neighboring Indonesia for back-breaking plantation work, which is shunned by most in more affluent Malaysia. Let's listen in. All right, thank you very much, Eliana, for keeping me company today here on Asin in Focus. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Alma, and thank you to everyone for joining us today here in STN in Focus. This is Eliana Sebastian from EBC Vietnam Bureau, and we live in extraordinary times. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you next week. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay safe, stay in the news, because we live in extraordinary times. Good day. Happy 108th anniversary po sa ating mga kapatid sa Iglesia ni Cristo sa pamumuno ni Ka Eduardo Manalo. 108 years din po ito na pagmamalasakit at pagtulong ninyo sa iba't ibang sektor ng mga Pilipino. Bahagi man ng INC o hindi. Kaya maraming maraming salamat po at kasama niyo po ako sa pagunita ng inyong anniversary na ipinasa natin sa ilalim ng Republika 9645 declaring July 27 as a special national working holiday in honor of Iglesia de Cristo's founding anniversary. Gusto ko rin pong magpasalamat ulit sa inyong tiwala at suporta nung nakaraang halalan. At ngayon pong nagsimula na ang bagong administrasyon at kongreso, asahan niyo po ang patuloy kong pagiging lingkod ninyo at ng buong bayan sa pagsupo sa kahirapan at pagpaunlad ng buhay ng bawat Pilipino. Sa suporta ninyo, magagawa natin ito. Kaya, huli, Happy Anniversary po at pagpalain po kayo palagi ng ating mahal na Panginoon. Hello mga ka-moments, nandito tayo ngayon sa Marcos Ancestral House at bibisitahin natin ng First Sister. Si Madam Aimee nandito o. Oh. Feeling Madonna. Meron pa kang ganun, buntis na Madonna.
Special Edition with guest Senator Aimee Marcos. Ayang pagbati sa ating minamahal na kapatid na Eduardo G. Manalo at ang buong kapatiran ng Iglesia ni Cristo sa pagdiriwang ng ikasandaan at walong anibersaryo ng pagkakatatag dito sa Pilipinas ng Iglesia ni Cristo. Nawapo ay lalong pagpalain ng Diyos Ama sa Kalangitan ang kongregasyon at ikong Iglesia ng kapatiran upang lumabong ang pagpapalaganap ang mga salita ng Diyos sa buong sangkatawan. Minabati ko rin po ang mga kapatid sa Iglesia ni Kristo sa iba't ibang panig ng mundo naway manatili sa inyong puso ang pag ng Espiritu ng Diyos at kapangyarihan ng ating Panginoong Heso Kristo. Mabuhay po kayo, Ka Eduardo Manalo. Mabuhay po ang lahat ng kapatid sa Iglesia ni Kristo. Mabuhay po ang buong Pilipinas. Mabuhay din po ang buong public attorney's office. Maraming salamat po. Happy 108th anniversary para sa buong Iglesia ni Kristo. Ang mga katagang pinya, husi, inabel, abaka, Yakan ay ilan lamang sa mga kilalang local o indigenous materials sa ating bansa. And these have been showcased in international fashion events through our local designers or craftsmen. How do we make more people wear local? What are the obstacles in making these fashionable pieces more accessible? And how does pop-up stores help in raising awareness on these unique Pieces. We'll find out from our special guest, Miss Mons Romulo, the visionary behind Katutubo. First of all, passion. You have to love what you're doing, but you have to also give the best quality. Only here, an open for business. Open for business with Cesar Vallejos every Sunday, 9 p.m. Greetings and happy 108th anniversary to all members of Iglesia Ni Cristo, Church of Christ all over the world. Congratulations to your Executive Minister, Brother Eduardo V. Manalo, for his dynamic leadership. Mabuhay and congratulations. Happy 108th anniversary to you all. This is Dexter Lee, Philippine Airlines Chief Strategy and Planning Officer. Ito pong si Alin, nagnakaw dito sa resort. Eh, wala ba sa inyong nakawitness? Oo, oh, ayaw! Ayaw! Tama na muna nga. Ayoko nga sumama. Kasi ako na naman ang pagbibigit niyo ng gamit niyo. Hindi na. Kasi ikaw na yung magsasagwan. Sira yung motor ng bangka. Bilis! Tara! Ilalagay ko itong mga bolang ito dito sa beach. Tapos hahanapin ninyo. Okay! Okay! Pinabati ko ang uh, kapatiran ng Iglesia ni Kristo sa kanilang uh, ika-108 anibersaryo. Uh, mabuhay ang uh, Iglesia ni Kristo at ang mga pamunuan nito at uh, kayo ay naging bahagi ng ating nation building dahil kayo ay talaga namang uh, mga mababait at uh, disiplinado at uh, nagmamahal ng tunay sa bayan. Mabuhay ang Iglesia ni Kristo. Abangan sa Lutong Daza. Anyong! All out Korean tayo this week sa Lutong Daza kasamang beauty, brains, and brawn na si Maureen Shrivers. Chicken galbi, japchae, Korean fried chicken, at Korean fried rice. Super sarap, habot kaya ng budget at napakadaling sundan ng mga recipe. Kita kiss sa Lutong Taza. Analo tayo pag
Greetings from the Philippine Chamber of Commerce in Industry, PCCI. Congratulations to Executive Minister Brother Eduardo B. Banalo on your 108th founding anniversary. Happy anniversary! Let's be that spark of hope, mga bidarkada. Armed with a capital of just 250 pesos and a determination to succeed, ngayon po ay unti-unti na niyang nalalasap ang tagumpay. Dati, imagine, ako lang mag-isa and then husband ko taga-deliver. Ngayon, meron na kaming apat na employees. Ang mga produkto na gagandahan leather goods na kaya ang makipagsabayan sa quality ng mga kilalang leather brands. At ang mga gumagawa gawa ng mga produkto at mga persons with disabilities. Marami ako natutunan working with PWDs. Hindi sila sumusuko sa laban ng buhay. Isang digit ang magpa- ay tinuturing nating photographic equipment o kaya ay laruan lamang ang drone. Dahil sa isang misteryong customer, ang isang TNVS driver ay nakapagahatid hindi lamang ng food orders, kundi pati na rin ng kagandahang loob at inspirasyon sa marami. Ako po ang inyong host, Aga Mulak, para sa Bida, kayo kay Aga.